Order members, the Minister of Finance and Personnel uh, wish you to make a statement to the House this afternoon. Minister. Mr Speaker, thank you for this opportunity to present the Executive's conclusions on both October monitoring allocations for 2013-14 and also the capital reallocations for 2014-15. Before I get into the detail of these issues, I would first like to present some information which sets the wider economic context to these public expenditure allocations. This is because this stage in the financial year is an opportune time to take stock of the key economic and financial indicators. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, it would be my intention to, in future years, use the opportunity the October monitoring round presents halfway through the budgetary year to update this House and the wider public on the economic and fiscal position in Northern Ireland by way of a mid-year financial statement. When making budget allocations, I believe it is an important factor to factor in the strategic positioning of our economy, thereby allowing an assessment of which sectors are currently in most need of assistance. I think it would be useful to now set out for all members what I believe the current position to be, as it will help develop a better understanding of both my announcements today and the key issues that we will have to address in the coming months as part of the 2015-2016 budget process. Looking at the economy first, it is clear that many key indicators are showing positive trends and the local economy has shown signs of improvement from the turn of 2013. The labour market is improving, with the number of people claiming unemployment benefits falling for seven consecutive months. This is the first time we have witnessed such a prolonged reduction in unemployment benefit claimants since August 2007. The unemployment rate has also fallen to 7.3 per cent, which is 0.4 percentage points below the UK rate and significantly below the Republic of Ireland and the Eurozone, um, who are at 3.5 per cent and 12.1 per cent, respectively. The lower unemployment figures are also reflected in the, um, in the employment trend with an additional 4,000 people now in employment compared to the same time last year. However, this is no time to become complacent, since the number of people in employment actually reduced over the last quarter, which indicates that the recovery is by no means secure. There are also signs of increased activity in the housing market. The latest residential property price index produced by Land and Property Services for quarter two of 2013 shows that residential property prices increased by 2 per cent compared to quarter one. Property sales were also up by an encouraging 10 per cent compared to a year before, which is another positive indicator. However, the housing market is in its early phase, our housing market recovery is in its early phase, with house prices still more than 50 per cent below their 2007 peak. Private sector activity is also picking up with the latest Ulster Bank Purchasing Managers Index recording a further rise in private sector business activity, such as new orders, employment and export across all sectors, retail, manufacturing and construction, during September, extending the current sequence of growth to three consecutive months. The latest PMI data also pointed to a fourth consecutive or successive increase in new business for Northern Ireland companies, with private sector firms increasing their staff levels for the third successive month. The fastest rises were seen in retail and construction companies, two sectors which we all know have endured a lot during the downturn. This economic recovery is also reflected in local tourism numbers. Quarterly figures show that over the year to March 2013, external visitor numbers were up by 4 per cent, and associated tourism expenditure also up by 10 per cent. The readout from the recent International Investment Conference is also very positive, and the growing number of job announcements made by Invest Northern Ireland show that Northern Ireland has the core requirements needed for growing a competitive private sector. This was also reflected in the recent UK Trade and Investment Report, which highlighted that in 2012-2013, Northern Ireland achieved an increase in new investment projects of 41 per cent compared to the year before. We are the second most attractive destination for foreign direct investment per head of the population in the whole of the United Kingdom, yeah. second only to London. Investments in our telecommunications infrastructure are fast making Northern Ireland, and Belfast in particular, an international capital for ICT financial services transactions. Unfortunately, growing this competitive dynamic sector of the economy will have to happen in parallel with the executive working to address some structural economic constraints. Northern Ireland's gross value added, a measure of the whole economy, stands at 29,870 million for 2011, 
£16,531 for every head of the population. This is 79.2% of the UK average, although it is up from 78.7% in 2010. Recent data shows that this region is still heavily dependent on fiscal transfers from the national economy, with a net subvention figure of 5850 per capita in 2010-2011, more than double the equivalent figure for the UK as a whole. Whilst our overall net fiscal deficit of £10.5 billion, or 38% of GVA, is down from its 2009-2010 peak of £10.8 billion, it is transparently obvious to all except those who do not wish to see that this region remains reliant on the rest of the United Kingdom for a significant amount of our public spending. Growing the private sector will increase the regional tax base, and this will help to address this fiscal deficit. The other side of the fiscal deficit question is the level of public expenditure made available to Northern Ireland. In that regard, we too uh, benefit from our place in the United Kingdom. 2011-2012's total identifiable expenditure on services shows Northern Ireland's per head spending at £10,782, higher than the UK average and the other two devolved regions. The public expenditure outlook is undoubtedly challenging, but it also provides me as Finance Minister with opportunities to promote economic growth and improve how we deliver public services. In terms of reforming public service delivery, I believe there is significant scope to drive forward reform and promote innovation within our public sector. My recent discussions with the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development have highlighted a number of areas such as collaborative procurement, widening shared services functions to embrace the wider public sector and local authorities, and also engineering genuine governance reform. These are issues that we need to pursue if we want to have lean and efficient delivery of public services to a standard that benchmarks well against international best practice, and I intend to make an announcement in respect of how we can progress this in the weeks ahead. The UK Spending Review announcement in June confirmed that our 2015-2016 resource Dell would increase by 0.6% in cash terms, while total capital Dell would increase by 3.3% in cash terms. This change in emphasis by the United Kingdom Government, whereby current spend is constrained to fund capital investment, is perfectly understandable, if perhaps challenging. Capital investment adds to the long-term economic capacity of an economy by improving competitiveness and generating positive returns. This, I think, presents us in Northern Ireland with an opportunity to genuinely focus policy attention on growing our economy, not paying lip service to the aim, but actually making tangible investments in our economic future. While the UK Government continues to afford budget protection to schools and health, Northern Ireland will benefit as we have full comparability under the Barnett formula. The Northern Ireland bloc is therefore relatively protected. However, as I said earlier, the resource budget side is going to continue to be constrained, with the latest Office of Budget Responsibility forecast suggesting that resource Dell will, at a UK level, decrease by 10.4% in real terms by 2017-2018. We will therefore have to consider carefully how we can continue to provide high-priority public services at a level that is acceptable to the public. Notice that I said continuing high-priority public services, because we will undoubtedly have to stop doing some things that we are currently are doing. The critical task will be to ensure that the executive departments deliver only the core functions that the public need and that are delivering the outcomes people desire. Spending on services that don't produce results is simply a waste of money that we don't have to squander. That question will automatically force departments to consider an efficiency agenda. Efficiency to some is the, the same as cuts, but not to me. Whilst it may involve reductions to low priority services, for me, efficiency is really about delivering key quality services with the minimum necessary level of inputs and obtaining outcomes. The benefit of having our resource budget envelope constrained in this way is that we as an executive have relatively high amounts of capital to invest in our economic future. In particular, a large tranche of the capital received from Her Majesty's Government is what is known as financial transactions capital, which has to go as loan and equity investment directly to private sector entities. That is actually a positive development because, by necessity, it requires government to partner with the private sector to invest in our infrastructure, and it requires the, uh, the private sector to produce innovative investment opportunities. This will assist in growing our private sector capacity. And furthermore, this need to engage with our private sector in enhancing our capital stock, 
will increase over the coming years as the UK Government is likely to make ever greater use of this financial transactions capital. Having set the scene, I would now like to turn first to the October monitoring round and then to the 2014-15 capital relocation reallocation exercise. Mr Speaker, as, as usual, the Executive's focus in the monitoring rounds is on the non-ring fence resource Dell. The non-ring fence resource Dell element is handled separately our non-cash ring fence resource Dell element is handled separately since this is strictly controlled by Her Majesty's Treasury and cannot be used for any other purpose. The starting point for this monitoring round is the June monitoring outcome, which resulted in an overcommitment on the resource Dell side of £16.8 million and an effective overcommitment on the capital investment side of £10.5 million. This capital overcommitment included a pre-commitment to fund the £17 million purchase of the Invest NI headquarters which has now concluded. There were also three centre items which impacted on the funding available in this round. The first was a regional rate income, with the latest forecast suggesting income in this financial year at £4 million below the level included in the budget position. This is entirely due to lower than expected increases in both the domestic and non-domestic tax bases. Members will also recall that in June monitoring, the Executive agreed to an amended Asset Management Unit capital receipts profile. This new profile allocated £19.4 million of additional capital receipts to the departments in this financial year, some £5.6 million less than the original target of £25 million. This therefore left a capital dial pressure to be addressed in this monitoring round. Finally, the latest position on the delivering social change projects and childcare strategy also had an impact on the funding position. There were a number of resource dial transfers under the delivering social change banner processed in the October monitoring round, and these include £2 million to the Department of Education, £0.8 million to the uh, Department of Employment and Learning, £0.33 million to FMDFM, and £0.04 million to DHSSPS. Since this funding is accessed from the Social Investment Fund set aside by the Executive for this purpose, these transactions were handled as technical transfers rather than allocations. OFMDFM has confirmed that £15 million of capital Dell held at the centre will not be required in this financial year and this was therefore made available for allocation in this monitoring round. The Department has further indicated that all of the residual resource Dell funding in respect of both the Social Investment Fund and childcare strategy, some £4.8 million, is likely to be utilised in this financial year. I will provide a further update on this in January. Of course, there were also reduced requirements surrendered by the departments in this monitoring round. These amounted to £42.7 million resource expenditure and £31.1 million capital investment. Full details are provided in the tables accompanied, accompanying this statement. Mr Speaker, it is good practice that departments seek to manage any emerging pressures within their existing allocations before bringing forward bids for additional allocations. The Public Expenditure Control Framework stipulates that internal departmental movements across spending areas in excess of the de minimis threshold require the Executive's approval. The movements agreed by the Executive in this round are also detailed in the tables. Departments may also, for a number of reasons, seek to reclassify expenditure from resource to capital or vice versa. All such reclassifications need executive approval, and these are shown in the tables provided with this statement. Furthermore, departments may also, subject to DFP approval, seek to move budgets between the ring fence and non ring fence resource Dell categories. The impact of these moves is shown in the table detailing the ring fence resource Dell position. All these issues impacted on the total amount of resource available to the Executive in this monitoring round. Once these were all taken into account, the Executive had £24.1 million resource Dell and £28.7 million of capital of Dell available for allocations. Against this funding available, departments submitted bids totalling £152 million in respect of resource expenditure and £72.7 million in terms of capital expenditure. The individual bids are also included in the tables attached to this statement. The level of allocations made by the Executive was informed by a judgment on the level of overcommitment that should be carried forward to the January monitoring round and the quality of bids submitted. The Executive agreed allocations totalling £43.5 million on the resource side and £36.8 million on the capital side. The individual allocations are detailed in the tables and I will therefore only highlight some of the main ones here. There was £41.2 million allocated to DRD. This allocation included an additional £15 million towards roads structural maintenance, a further £5 million towards other roads improvement, and £1.5 million towards the Macrofeld bypass project. 
It also allows DRD to address a pressure of £2 million in regard to land compensation costs and fund a £1.7 million loan to Londonderry Port, which will enable the port to carry out improvements, having secured an investment in an £80 million renewable power station. It would also provide £6 million for street lighting renewal works and safety testing. Finally, it includes a residual £10 million towards the DRD budget shortfall in relation to the release of value from the Belfast Harbour Commissioners. The Executive also agreed to provide £14 million to DHSS PS, reflecting the high priority that the Executive continues to attach to the provision of quality health care. I am very pleased that this allocation will allow our hospitals to address thousands of elective care pressures in a range of specialities and seek to reduce waiting lists. There was also £6.3 million allocated to DARD. This provides £5 million towards addressing a pressure in respect of TB compensation. This also allows DARD to fund an additional pressure of £1.3 million in respect of the hardship funding provided for in the June monitoring round. There was also £5 million to DSD to fund additional investment in the co-ownership scheme, which remains oversubscribed. This will assist a further uh, 100 first-time buyers and provide a further stimulus for the local housing market. The allocations made in this monitoring round were skewed heavily towards improving our roads and transport infrastructure. This will reap economic returns in the long term and also provide a short-term boost for our construction sector. Before turning to the 2014-15 capital reallocation exercise, I would like to update members on the latest position in respect to financial transaction capital funding. Members will recall that in June monitoring, the Executive allocated £10 million to DETI for the Agri-Food Loan Scheme. This scheme has now been announced and further funding may be utilised in the last quarter of this financial year if demand exceeds the initial allocation. I can now also announce that the Executive has allocated £5 million for the DSD Affordable Homes Loan Fund and £3.7 million towards the Empty Homes Loan Scheme. This still leaves some £20.9 million of residual financial transactions capital available in this financial year. My officials have been in discussion with Her Majesty's Treasury on potential end-of-year flexibility in respect of the financial transactions capital. Indications are that some limited flexibility may well be available, uh, although this has not yet been confirmed by Treasury Ministers. I will update colleagues on this issue and any further allocations at January monitoring. October monitoring concluded with an overcommitment of £19.4 million in respect of resource expenditure and £8 million in terms of capital expenditure. I believe this is perfectly manageable at this stage of the financial year. I will now turn to the 2014-15 capital reallocation exercise. The capital reallocation exercise was commissioned by my officials over the summer, and its aim was to reallocate funding that was likely to be available in 2014-15 following delay in major projects such as the A5 road scheme. This reflects the critical importance I attach to sound strategic capital budget planning. We need to make the most of our scarce resources, and this exercise will help us to achieve that. Before I detail the 2014-15 capital allegations, allocations agreed by the Executive, I will briefly touch on some of the key funding assumptions that shaped the indicative financial envelope available for disposal. The starting position was the existing capital Dell overcommitment for 2014-15, which was £18.5 million. Pounds. The Executive is also facing a significant overcommitment on the resource Dell side next year, and I will say more about this later. However, to help address this resource Dell overcommitment, the Executive agreed to reverse a previous resource to capital switch of £6 million next year. There were also departmental easements identified by two departments, which were £115 million from DRD due to delay in the A5 road project and £7.8 million from DARD in respect of the DARD HQ relocation project. This funding will be surrendered as part of next year's June monitoring round. There was also an additional £15 million spending power arising from the RRI borrowing reprofiling previously agreed with Her Majesty's Treasury. There was a further £6 million freed up from the Department of Education baseline as a result of a successful United Community bid in 2014-15. Dodge also previously agreed to surrender £10 million of capital funding in 2014-15. There will also likely to be some carry forward of capital investment from this year uh, and into the next, and for planning purposes, this is expected to be some £10 million, which is broadly in line with the experience in the last few years. Against these additional pressures, there was also a capital Dell pressure of £23.9 million in 2014-15 from the, following from the, the Executive's decision in June monitoring to retain a number of income-generating assets previously earmarked 
for disposal in 2014-15. Of course, the retention of these assets will benefit the resource side next year and beyond. Finally, the Executive is due to receive £25 million in 2014-15 in respect of the A5 road scheme from the Republic of Ireland Government. However, due to the ongoing delay to this project, it is not yet certain that this receipt will materialise in 2014. I will be discussing this issue with my counterpart in Dublin in the near future. All of these planning assumptions provided the Executive with an indicative capital funding envelope of £125.5 million. However, this was without any overcommitment, and the Executive agreed that, based on previous years' underspends, we would commit, overcommit by around £40 million. And this would then significantly increase the funding available. The Department submitted 2014-15 capital bids worth um, 50, 502.6 million pounds. A summary of all of these bids is included in the tables attached to this statement. It was clearly not possible to all bids submitted uh, to meet all bids submitted, and the executive attached highest priority to discrete infrastructure projects that could deliver considerable spend in 2014-15. Such projects will not only improve our infrastructure and contribute to long-term economic growth, but also provide an immediate boost to the lo local construction sector. The capital allocations, Mr Deputy Speaker, are detailed in tables, and I will highlight the most significant ones. The Executive allocated £75.2 million to DRD. In terms of road infrastructure, this will allow DRD to continue construction of the A8 Belfast Alarn Road Scheme and commence work on the much-needed A31 Macrofelt Bypass Project. I am extremely pleased to announce an allocation of £8.1 million in 2014-15, which will allow the commencement of work on the A26 Glaryford yeah. Road Scheme, where an additional eight kilometres of dual carriageway will be built, improving access and road safety on that key route. Furthermore, funding will deliver planned road structural maintenance and other road improvements. It will also ensure that DRD can complete bus procurement orders initiated in 2013-14 and begin replacement of, I am happy to say, the Strangford Deporta Ferry and Rathlin Ferries. Very popular one. DRD will also commence early design and preparatory work for the A6 Randallstown to Castle Dawson Road Scheme. Importantly, the A6 preparatory work does not commit the executive contractually to this project. The executive took a view that until there is clarity on the A5 project, we cannot afford to overcommit or commit contractually to the A6 project, since delivering both in parallel is unaffordable without a serious detrimental impact on all other departmental capital budgets. The executive also agreed, Deputy Speaker, to allocate £33 million to the Department of Health. Two weeks ago, I accepted an invitation from the Health Minister to visit the Children's Hospital at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. I was shocked by what I saw. Dedicated health professionals going beyond the call of duty to treat some extremely ill children, but doing so in surroundings that I am ashamed to say are far from fit for purpose. Therefore, I am immensely pleased that this allocation enables the Department to begin construction on a new children's hospital yeah. at the Royal Victoria site in Belfast. A new state-of-the-art regional hospital to care for sick children from all over Northern Ireland. It also allows the Department to proactively manage health and safety risks throughout the health estate and progress other estate improvements. It also provides DHSSPS with additional funding to take forward a number of capital projects under the Transforming Your Care Reform Programme and the construction of a new bespoke logistics and support centre for the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. There was also £19.9 million allocated to DARD. This provides additional funding for the Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme Access 1 and 3. Uh, which offers capital funding to farmers to, uh, to areas such as improved competitiveness and greater access to high-speed broadband services in rural areas. It also provides funding for further flood alleviation works in East Belfast and Beira. There is also funding to support the aims and objectives of the recently published Agri-Food Strategy Board Going for Growth Strategy and an upgrade to three areas of Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute facilities at the Hillsborough and Stormont sites. There is also £16.1 million to DECAL to address a significant pressure next year in respect of the regional stadium construction programme. £11.8 million was allocated to the Department of Employment and Learning. This will fund a new faculty block at the University of Ulster Coleraine, redevelopment at Queen's University, 
uh, essential asbestos removal at Strammillis University College and a new build, Further Education College in Banbridge. DOE will receive £3 million for heritage-led development on top of the £1.1 million it will receive for the same in the October monitoring round. Members may recall that I brought a motion to the Assembly earlier this year acknowledging the economic value of Northern Ireland's outstanding historic buildings. So I am pleased that this allocation will see assets like those of Carrick, Fergus Castle and Dundrum Castle enhanced. In total, the Executive agreed allocations of £177 million, which results in an indicative 2014-15 capital overcommitment of £51.6 million. While it's very challenging, I believe this should be manageable through the in-year process. However, it will most likely mean that there will be little capital funding available for allocation through the monitoring rounds next year. I view this as a positive development since it reflects the fact that the Executive has now taken a more strategic approach to capital budget planning. Before I conclude this statement, I would like to take this opportunity to also update the House on United Community Projects and 2014-15 financial transactions allocations. Members will be aware that the Executive secured, as part of the Economic Pact, additional borrowing power of £50 million in 2014-15 and 2015-16 for shared housing and education projects. I can confirm today that the Listen Ellie project involving a shared school site in Oma will be funded from this additional borrowing power to the amounts of £6 million in 2014-15 and £9 million in 2015-16. My officials continue to work with the departments and Her Majesty's Treasury on identifying further projects that may benefit from this additional funding source. The Executive currently Deputy Speaker, has £59.3 million of financial transactions capital available in 2014-15 and £104.3 million in 2015-16. As part of the capital exercise, departments submitted bids totalling £68.9 million for 2014-15. These are shown in the tables attached to this statement. The bids submitted generally appeared perfectly viable, although with some uncertainty around the amount of funding required. This is because these schemes are generally demand-led, and actual funding requirements and the exact timing of these will only be known when the schemes are fully operational. The Executive therefore agreed initial allocations to those schemes that were considered viable at this point in time, with a commitment to consider the position again in June next year. There were three financial transactions allocations agreed by the Executive at this time. The first was £10 million to Deddy for the Agri-Food Loan Scheme in the 2014-15 financial year. The second allocation was £13 million to DSD to advance two further housing schemes, including an affordable homes, homes loan scheme and an empty homes scheme. Both these schemes will boost housing market supply and assist hard-pressed first-time buyers. Finally, the Executive agreed to allocate £5 million to DHSS PS to take forward loan schemes for improvements and equipment purchase by GPs and dentists. These allocations mean that there is still £31.3 million of financial transactions funding available next year. This can then be allocated to those schemes that experience high demand or indeed alternative schemes that may materialise at that time. The allocations of £177 million resulted in an indicative 2014-15 capital overcommitment of £51.6 uh, million. This includes a £6 million capital Dell to resource Dell switch, which, is, which will result in a 14-15 resource Dell overcommitment of £94.5 million. Addressing these overcommitments will be a significant challenge for the executive next year. Mr Deputy Speaker, the allocations I have announced today will leave a lasting economic impact on Northern Ireland and help our economy as a recovery gathers momentum. This is one of the real benefits of our budget reallocation process, that we can use easements in some departments to fund good projects that will deliver an economic return in the long term. The gathering economic recovery I spoke of earlier will be further supported by investment in our roads and public transport network of some £91 million across this year and the next. I have also announced some £12 million of additional investment in our further education and higher education estates, which will improve facilities for students here. These investments will not only provide extra construction jobs in the short term, but also support long-term economic growth. Our health sector has also received a significant boost both in this year and in particular with the additional capital investments next year. A key project to highlight is the new Children's Hospital, which will commence next year and, when completed, will offer a modern care environment for children in Northern Ireland. This is a project that I am sure all sides of this Assembly have called for, and I am more than happy to give it the green light today. There is also a much-needed boost for our farming and agri-food sector, 
with an additional £15 million for the Rural Development Programme and Agri-Food Strategy Board, and a further £10 million worth of financial transactions funding committed to the Agri-Food Loan Scheme for next year. In short, Mr Deputy Speaker, the allocations I have announced today for this year and next will sustain and create jobs, they will aid our recovery, they will develop our infrastructure and give us a competitive edge, they will generate opportunities for all, and they will provide help for the vulnerable. Deputy Speaker, I am determined to play my part in supporting economic recovery across Northern Ireland, and I strongly believe that the allocations announced today will do just that. I commend this statement to the Assembly. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. And, uh, just before I call Dahi Mackay, the Chair of the Finance Committee, I will give obviously some latitude to you as the Chair. But uh, this statement has obviously attracted a considerable level of interest amongst the, uh, the members present, and I have a very significant list of speakers. So can I appeal at the start for members to come straight to the point in terms of their question, and allow them all to get in. Okay, Mr. Dahi Mackay. Gurum, I got a pre last concord, and can I tell you I would take full advantage of your latitude uh, th this morning, th this afternoon, rather. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his statement, uh, a pre last concord, and uh, can I be the first to welcome uh, the fact that the Executive has agreed uh, to fund the A26 to the tune of 8.1 million, which is long, long overdue, and I'm sure all members from North Antrim uh, and elsewhere will, will agree with me in regard to that there. In terms of the increase in capital, it is good for construction, it will be good for growth, uh, and that also has to be welcomed. In terms of the October monitoring round, uh, it is important, uh, obviously, in ensuring that the executive remains within the budget exchange scheme limits, uh, and that we avoid a situation where we return, water, uh, return money across the water. Uh, and can I ask you, Minister, how confident are you uh, that the permits will not declare further uh, significant reduced requirements at the January monitoring round, uh, when there will be less opportunity uh, for reallocations? I thank the chair for his question, Deputy Speaker. And look, I. I, I Thank him for his welcome for the commitment to capital uh, that is contained within both the October monitoring and the uh, uh, reallocation exercise for 2014-15. Um, how confident am I about departments not declaring uh, returns in, in reduced requirements in January? I think we have to expect that there will be some because pressures will develop over the, the, the year. That means that uh, departments simply can't afford or can't deliver on the allocations that they have been given in the budget. And indeed, sometimes some of the allocations that they've been given in, in monitoring rounds because of a whole variety of circumstances. I think, though, the lesson of the last number of years, Deputy Speaker, is that departments are now much better at managing their budgets as a result of the pressure, I have to say, that local ministers are putting on them, that committees are putting on them, that assemblies are putting on them, and that the scrutiny that we get from outside of this place puts on them. Uh, as a result of that, in the, the last uh, couple of years, since 2010, when end year flexibility ended and was replaced by the budget exchange scheme, we have not sent a single penny back to Treasury in those years. I think that is something to be welcomed. I think our more prudent and sensible fiscal management over that period of time is something I think that we should be warmly welcoming because we are able to retain that money here, as you know, Deputy Speaker, to invest in the sort of services and in the sort of capital projects that I've been able to outline in this statement today. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Speaker, could I join in welcoming the Minister's statement? Can I ask him what the financial impact, w impact would be on the economy, particularly in the roads infrastructure projects to the northwest, the A26 uh, to the north coast, and the A6 uh, on from the M2? Uh, thank the member for, for his question. And the member um, was one of the first to, to, to lobby me for the A26 whenever I, I, I came into post. I think I, my backside had barely hit the seat. Uh, when an invitation to visit his part of the world uh, hit, hit my desk. Um, I was very, very pleased to, to, to visit Coleraine, and one of, the, um, one of the events that we did was meet with a local haulier who pointed out to us the, the detrimental effect, the slowness of the, the current A26 was having upon his business, and that if more of that road could be dual, then obviously it would be a great boost to his business. But it's not just his business, it's other businesses, manufacturing businesses in the, um, the North Coast area and the East London area and North Antrim areas who will also benefit from it, as well as reducing um, commuter times in and out of, of Belfast. Um, and, and of course it will significantly improve road safety in that stretch of the road. That, that stretch of the road, as a member, will be, will be aware of the stretch that will be affected by this investment of um, some £60 million over the next number of years, ending in 2017-2018. Um, that stretch of road has unfortunately taken far too many lives down through the years. Um, so, mercifully, that 
money will be able to improve road safety standards there and hopefully ensure that uh, events like that don't happen in the future. The economic value of of investing in infrastructure I think is clear. We have a great proposition in Northern Ireland in terms of our skills and our highly educated people. We have some of the best telecommunications infrastructure in the world, as I was highlighting earlier in my statement. But if you don't have the roads infrastructure to back that up, if you don't have other elements of infrastructure, then it doesn't attract people to come and invest in your economy. And I am glad that in today's statement, some £250 million worth of investment, the vast bulk of that, Deputy Speaker, going in a capital direction will greatly improve our infrastructure and, and only serve to improve Northern Ireland as a place to attract investment and to grow companies and to create jobs. Thank you. And I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Thank you very much, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. And can I take this opportunity to welcome the announcement around the Children's Hospital? That will be uh, super news for families and uh, most vulnerable children. Uh, it will be good for the wider north and, of course, uh, for South Belfast. But can I refer to something that he uh, mentioned earlier in his statement, the Social Investment Fund? And can he confirm that any monies allocated from that will be allocated solely on objective need? Well, I think the, it is the first time I've had the opportunity formally in the House to um, welcome the member to his new position. I'm, it's as much of a, uh, an adaptation for me as it is for him, because I've been well used to being interviewed by him down through the years. I suppose it's a different type of questioning that I will now receive from the member. Um, I, I thank him for his, his welcome for the, the Children's Hospital, which I'm sure will meet with universal praise around this House and, and beyond. Um, the details of the Social Investment Fund are not a matter for me. They're a matter that are better directed to colleagues in the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Uh, and I won't go into any issues about how it's going to be allocated or when it's going to be allocated. Um, some allocations have been made from the money that has been allocated to the Social Investment Fund, including money for um, family support going to the Department of Health and Social Services and, and the very good uh, scheme for um, graduate teachers to try to lift standards in our, in our primary and our secondary schools. Uh, so money is being spent. There is still money to be spent. I'm confident that the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister are working through all of the various projects, both capital and resource, um, um, that will benefit from that money. And if there's any particular details about how that will be spent, I think that's probably better directed to the First and Deputy First Minister. Thank you. And I call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And again, can I thank the Minister for the announcement on the 826. Uh, also, Minister, in regards to the announcement for the new Children's Hospital build, is there any indication of any bids coming forward to provide services in that or new services so that we just don't retain the provision that is there but also provide it as a centre of excellence that can prevent having to send some of our six children across the water but can actually use this facility to treat our own children? Uh, thank, thank the member for, for his question. Um, the short answer is, is no. Um, uh, there is um, obviously the, the the services that will go into this facility. It's very early stages in terms of determining exactly what will go in. Again, probably better directed to the, the health minister now that he has the confidence, Deputy Speaker, that this money, some £160 million of a project, has been allocated. It gives him greater confidence. It gives the trust in Belfast and the Royal Victoria Hospital a greater confidence about what they can put in this site. Um, I do know from having visited the site um, two weeks ago that what is being done there is miraculous, quite frankly, in the circumstances and the surroundings that people are working in. Uh, and what is great about this allocation today um, is that we will shift where the hospital currently is and integrate it much more into the rest of the acute hospital. So some of the, the, the awful sets of circumstances where children who are acutely ill are having to be moved by ambulance within, a, within an existing site will end and, and children will be able to get a better, far, far better service and be less traumatic for their parents. Uh, and, and a better experience all round in what are very, very difficult circumstances. In terms of the services, I would imagine that the Minister of Health, with the money that he has been now allocated to spend on this uh, absolutely vital project for a strategic uh, project for the whole of Northern Ireland, will be seeking to ensure that the maximum amount of services in a modern state-of-the-art facility are delivered. Thank you. And I call Ms Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement this morning. A lot of very positive um, decisions um, that have been taken, particularly around fl flood alleviation in East Belfast, given the, the rain we've had over this weekend. Um, sticking with, with health, um, then uh, at the moment, would the Minister um, be able to indicate how far the 14 million allocation um, for health will go to address waiting lists for elective procedures? I think we. Member for her, her, her welcome. Um, one of the things that I didn't highlight was that there's uh, money allocated for 
the roof of this building, and given the rain that is falling outside, I know the members are a member of the Assembly Commission, so we are very grateful that uh, there will not be any flooding inside this uh, chamber as a result of that allocation. Uh, the £14 million pounds for, for health is, um, I think, a very welcome investment for the, finan- or by, from the, for the health minister, um, because as we know, and all of us know from our constituency work, and I have had Uh, discussions with the Health Minister directly about the pressures that he and his department and the trusts who are working under him are are under, that there is significant pressure across a whole range of of specialisms, um, and what what the the money will do, the £14 that has been allocated in the monitoring round for this year, will help to alleviate pressures on both in- and outpatient procedures across a whole range of specialisms, ENT, orthopaedics, um, paediatrics, gynaecology, right across the board. Um, and, and I, the estimate is, obviously, this depends on, on the type of procedures that are brought forward, but it will be around 10 to 12,000 procedures will be able to be taken. Additional procedures will be able to happen this year, which will obviously be great news for those people who benefit from that, but from our perspective, reduces waiting lists and eases some of that pressure, that significant pressure that the health budget continues to be under. Thank you. And I call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Principal Speaker, I also warmly welcome the statement, but I will not incur your wrath by going any further than that. And can I ask the Minister, uh, is the Minister confident that all financial transactions, capital funding in this year, will be utilised? It is not like the member to not try to incur wrath from, from somebody. But, um, the, the, this is obviously a new innovation from uh, Treasury in terms of trying to increase the, the capital um, budget right across the United Kingdom in a way that does not score uh, against uh, national borrowing levels. It, it, it means that it presents a challenge for me, it presents a challenge for executive colleagues because, uh, by necessity, we have to partner, Deputy Speaker, with the private sector, with investors outside of the public sector to bring forward some schemes. We have had some early successes with the Agri Food uh, Loan Scheme, which is in this year going to give £10 million to allow um, um, poultry, and in the first instance, uh, processors and producers to try to capitalise on the fact that supermarkets are trying to source more of their products from the United Kingdom. So that will help to, to do that. And there's been some money granted to DSD to try to stimulate different areas of the housing market. There's some, some £21 million pounds left in this year in terms of financial transactions capital. The challenge that I put out and continue to put out to executive colleagues is that they have to be more imaginative. They have to be more innovative about schemes that can be brought forward. There may be schemes that they're sitting with on their list of, of desired capital projects which have been not quite forgotten about but haven't had the concentration that some of the other ones have. Conventional capital is going to be limited moving forward. This financial transactions capital is going to take up a greater, a greater percentage of that. It's up to ministers to be imaginative and creative about the sort of projects that they bring forward and, where possible, partner with the private sector to ensure that we all benefit and our society as a whole benefits from getting capital projects that might otherwise not have come forward, forward and on the ground much earlier. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill. Oh, hi, Shin. Good morning. I've got a brief lesson. based on Ireland relation. Right, just Shin. I thank the minister for his statement. I particularly welcome the A26 announcement uh, at Garryford. But will the minister also acknowledge the despair of people along the A6, which has been a project much longer in the waiting for, uh, and which carries, of course, the main road between the two major cities in uh, this part of the world? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I, I share the the member's support for the A6, uh, perhaps for different reasons. Obviously, he represents the area. Um, um, but I think it is, in, is critically important that our two major cities are better connected in terms of, of rail. There has been significant investment in rail down through the years, and I think it is also critically important in terms of, of road. Um, as the, the member will appreciate, um, it is a large uh, road infrastructure project to take forward the A6, and it would certainly be so whilst the A5 project is still somewhat in abeyance. The, the Executive Deputy Speaker is committed, still committed to the A5 scheme. And my concern in looking at allocations in, in for 14-15 was that if I was to make more of a commitment to um, the A6, it would, would contractually oblige us to move that project forward. If the A5 then started to move forward, then you would have two of the biggest road schemes in Northern Ireland's history moving forward simultaneously. And that would be something that, whilst we might be able to afford it out of our total capital budget, would mean that there would be no investment in things like the regional children's hospital. There would be no investment in some of the capital projects that the Dard minister is bringing forward, or indeed other ministers are bringing forward. So a judgment was made 
that to, to allocate £1 million to allow some preparatory work that did not take us beyond being contractually obliged to the A6 was the, the sensible and prudent thing to do at this stage. And should the A5 not move forward for whatever reason, then we are in a better position then to start taking the A6 forward. And just to give the, the member a bit of an indication, the, 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 the stretch between Castle Dawson and Randallstown would cost £130 million and would take some five years from now to do. So you are committing yourself to a long period of time and a large amount of money over that period of time. But I think that those who are affected most directly by the A6 should, should seek some comfort and seek some solace in the fact that we are allocating some small amounts of money to at least allow the project to move rather than it sit on a shelf and not have anything done. If the money becomes available for whatever reason and through whatever means in the future, then like the A26, which can be delivered in the time and isn't as costly as that small section of the A6, um, that it can be then taken forward whenever money does become available, should that arise in the future. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula Bradley. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, can I also thank the Minister for his very comprehensive statement this morning. Uh, within this monitoring round, there has been additional money given to DECAL for the UK City of Culture. Can I ask the Minister, has, this, has a business case been approved on this? The, I think er, anybody who I have spoken to has been part of the, the City of UK, the first UK City of Culture in Londonderry uh, has, has considered it to be a success in terms of generating more interest in the city and developing the infrastructure and a lot of the investments that the executive has made in previous years. Uh, we're seeing that pay off in terms of the types of events that we're able to attract uh, to the North West, some for the first time. And I know the, the Turner Prize is, is being launched this week, uh, first time it's ever been outside of London, I think. I think that's a, a real success for the city. Um, I, I look forward to some. I, th I think it's important as well, one of the lessons that we learned probably from the Olympics, although not on the same scale by any means as the Olympics, is that we do ensure that the legacy is something that is sustained from, from the investment that we do put in. So I think it is important that DECAL does do that. Uh, I look forward to, to progress being made by DECAL in terms of producing a business case, uh, Deputy Speaker, to capture the critical aspects of the City of Culture <coughs> Legacy pro Programme. And obviously there's allocations have been made to that, but I await the business case which will have to be revised to ensure that that can be spent appropriately. Thank you. And I call Ms May from McLaughlin. Thank the Minister for his statement here today. Uh, I also want to welcome the capital allocation to the uh, Children's Hospital. I, I do hope that it provides a renewed focus in relation to the Children's Heart Service issue. But specifically, can I ask, in relation to the 14 million allocation to health, um, all of that money is in for elective care. Uh, there was a number of beds unsuccessful. But however, the department informed the committee just last week uh, that actually its priorities were clinical negligence and transforming your care, and thirdly, elective care. Can I ask, has the Finance Minister uh, taken on board or not taken on board the Department's priorities in relation to this? Dr. Well, I, think, I think from the initial position we, we come at in terms of health in um, monitoring rounds, Deputy Speaker, is that actually health shouldn't be bidding and shouldn't be receiving anything in monitoring rounds. Um, and Dodge is similarly ring-fenced in its funding as well. And the Health Minister has considerable flexibility within his budget, which he enjoys as a result of the settlement uh, for the 2011-2015 budget. Um, and, but yet we, we, as an executive, accept and acknowledge that he is a minister whose budget is under constant and continued pressure. Um, the elective care was, is something that obviously we are deeply concerned about as an executive because there are considerable pressures, any amount, um, almost endless amounts of pressure in terms of people who need those sort of in and out patient uh, procedures that this money, some 10 to 12,000 that this money will allow to happen. Obviously, it's not as much as the minister bid for. He bid for some 26 million of it, but the 14 million is, is more than perhaps he, he should have been permitted in monitoring rounds because of the agreement that was reached at the budget time, because the executive recognised that there was such significant pressure looming on the horizon for the health minister that it was better to attempt to nip that in the bud now rather than him come back in January whenever things might be in a much worse position. I accept that there are other bids in terms of transforming your car which weren't met in this monitoring round, but there was a substantial amount of capital transforming your car bids met in the 14-15 capital reallocation exercise. And I am aware as well that there is a backlog of outstanding cases in terms of clinical negligence, which the department are losing um, because a, a judge is bringing those forward. And I have spoken to the health minister and I have 
um, assured him that this is an area which we, will, we can examine again in January if those pressures have not been relieved elsewhere within his existing budget. Thank you. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to welcome the statement by the Minister and the General Trust in relation to trying to grow the private sector of the economy. In relation to the A5, there are about five references to the A5 in the statement. But can I ask the Minister, is it still a commitment that the money allocated for by the Treasury was earmarked money project specific? And is it still the commitment of the Executive to realise that project? I thank the member, Deputy Speaker, for his question. I think it is somewhat confusing that the money that, was, that comes as part of our budget was not specifically earmarked for the A5 project. Um, the executive does remain committed to what was agreed to be taken forward in the A5, which was a, a reduced but still fairly significant in terms of size uh, and distance of, of road project. Um, the issue, as the member knows, something better for the DRD minister to take forward is the outstanding issues in terms of um, um, consultation uh, in respect of environmental aspects of the, the project. Um, the minister has said that he does not believe that that will be resolved in time to spend that money for next year. So he has re released uh, 115, or 100, around 150 million pounds. It was 115 this year and closer to 150 this year for the I-5, which I am glad to say that we are now able to recycle and reuse for other significant strategic road projects elsewhere in Northern Ireland. I am sure the member and I am sure other people within his local community that he represents will be disappointed that the A5 is not moving forward, but um, we are able to at least progress some other strategically significant road projects elsewhere in Northern Ireland as a result of the, I think, the prudent and strategic financial capital management that we have undertaken as part of this exercise. Thank you, and I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I would also thank the Minister for a statement. I, I thought the economic overview was helpful. But could I suggest to him that if he could improve on that 10 minutes' time before the meeting, so in fact we can do the report justice, it would also be much appreciated. My question is on the macro capital level. There are many switches there between resource capital and vice versa. Many changes there, and we're sort of halfway through the year, and I like the, the idea of, of doing that mid-term evaluation. But there are some areas where capital is at risk. For example, we're talking about an overcommitment this year of some eight million and next year of some fifty million. Uh, under the financial transactions, capital is twenty nine twenty point nine million available this year, which I believe is at risk. Minister, is there some way we can perhaps uh, rationalise the overall capital envelope somewhat? And how sure are you that, that twenty point nine million will be saved this year? Thank the, the member for, for his question. Um, I endeavoured. I think the statement should have been in your pigeonhole, and certainly they were talking about half an hour beforehand. I, I did my best to slow up in reading it. I'd give you probably, if you had got it from right from the start, I'd give you about an hour to digest it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do be better and we'll attempt to do better in future. Um, the cap, capital is, ap is, is critically important, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of developing our economy and growing our economy and assisting and aiding our recovery. This is something that we in this house have been attempting, Deputy Speaker, to make clear to the Westminster Government since before the 2011-2015 budget came forward. That budget cut initially our capital allocation by around 40 per cent. I think sometimes we forget how significant a cut to capital it was. Um, they now, it is clear, whilst they will probably use these precise words, regret the fact that they went too far too fast at our capital budget. Um, it had a significantly detrimental impact on a sector that was struggling anyway, that being the construction sector. Um, we have tried to ameliorate that as best we can over the last number of years through some current to capital switches and through accelerating some capital asset sales, which have generated some income that we can redeploy back into to capital projects. Um, but that in no way closed the gap from where, where spending was to where it had started off at this budget period. I'm glad that they have now started to re reverse their position. I'm glad that they are now investing much more in capital. We are, better, we are utilising that as best we can. And I hope that today's statement highlights the fact that we are doing that, with the likes of the Children's Hospital and the A26 uh, moving forward now. Um, in terms of getting the spending that we have this year, because there's no point in having additional spending if you can't spend it. And I do have issues, I have to say, with how we procure and how we take forward 
significant capital projects, which is something I want to concentrate on as an area of work. In terms of spending the money that we have, we have some 20, we've, we've already allocated about 29, we have about 21 left in FTC this year. I was saying to Mr. Weir, this will be a growing aspect of our capital budget, will be this, this different type of capital. Um, I am confident that we can get that expenditure taken forward. I am continually putting pressure and asking officials to do likewise on other departments to come forward with this uh, schemes that will absorb this money. Um, and yes, we, we, we're absolutely, we do have a large overcommitment for next year at around 50 million. It is um, going to be challenging next year. It means that we shouldn't overcommit in terms of capital this year for next year. And next year, I don't think you'll see me come forward to the, um, the House and giving large amounts of capital allocations. Um, but I think, looking at previous experience, I think we can ensure that that overcommitment is well managed, that we do spend absolutely every single penny that we have at our disposal on capital because of the boost that it gives in the short to medium term to our construction sector and in the longer term the improvements that it gives to our infrastructure that assists and aids and develops our economic competitiveness. And I call Mr John McAllister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, like others, uh, welcome the statement and certainly welcome the announcement about the Children's Hospital. Let's hope we have something to put in it. Um, Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister, he's painted quite a rosy picture today in light of his, his previous answers there about uh, the reduction in capital uh, expenditure in this budgetary period. Is he basically engaged in a cleaning up exercise and trying to help the executive out of the mess of the A5? I will ignore the member's fairly churlish remarks at the, the, the start. Um, you know, the, the A5, I, I, in some ways, like I'm, I, I'm tempted not to get involved in some sort of domestic squabble between himself and his former party. <laughs> if, 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 he believes, if he believes the handling of the A5 has been a mess, I tend to agree that aspects of it weren't handled particularly uh, well by the minister. Uh, for regional development. I would, I would point the, the member to take it up with his former colleague, um, uh, the Minister for Regional Development. The, 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 A, the A5 is a, is a strategically important project which the Executive is committed to for reasons which are better directed in terms of questioning to the Minister for Regional Development. That can't go forward. I think the, the, the foolish thing to have done would have been just sit back and say, well, look, that's it, I can't move forward, we'll not do anything about it. The sensible thing to do is what I have done today, which is to announce to this House that we are taking that money that can't be spent on that, and indeed other capital money that can't be spent, and some of the capital money that has come from Treasury, um, following on from, from some of the questions that Mr Cree asked, and invest that money wisely in other roads across Northern Ireland, the likes of the A26, which is a strategically important road as well, improves journey times, improves road safety, the likes of the, the A31 around Macrofeld, a much needed bypass, and as well as doing those important road projects, we can invest that money in the Children's Hospital, which is in need of significant investment, as the member will well know. So instead of being churlish, I would have thought the member might want to, might want to welcome what are good, sensible, sound investments in improving the infrastructure, which will deliver better services for the people of Northern Ireland and will assist us in our economic recovery. Thank you, and I call Ms Pam Brown. Thank you, Speaker, and I also welcome the statement from the Finance Minister uh, this morning, and very much welcome the positive announcement in relation to the new regional children's hospital. Can I ask the Minister um, what the timescale is on this very significant project? I think the, the member for a question. I know that as a member of the, the Health Committee, she's been, um, along with others, pushing for um, the commencement of this project for, for some time. Um, whilst there is only a, a small amount of, for the project um, going forward this year, some £15 million pounds going this year, it is a big project. That allows it to get the green light, allows it to start going ahead, allows the Health Minister and the Trust to plan for the development to take it forward. It is a scheme that is not due uh, for completion until 2017-2018. And its total cost will be some £161.1 million. And I'm sure the member would agree with me that that is money well spent on a service that will provide assistance and help at the time that it is required for children and for families from all across Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr Raymond McCartney. Good morning, good morning. 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 Can I thank you? Principal Deputy Speaker, and indeed thank the Minister for both his statement and his, his answers to date, and, and indeed welcome his commitment to the A5. 
and welcome the, the, the announcement for money for the City of Culture. I'm sure the first tranche of, of money for the City of Culture Legacy Programme. Can I ask the, the, the Minister a question in relation to the, the legal aid uh, budget? Uh, as you will be well aware, it has always been the Legal Service Commission have never accurately predicted the budget for legal aid. I'm just wondering now that the Department is doing a focused piece of work in trying to make their predictions accurate. Will the department, your department, have any role in assessment? Well, we have. Um, I'm, I'm well aware of the. the uh, I thank him for his, his welcome for the statement. I'm well aware of the criticism of the legal aid process that the member has um, highlighted. I attended recently attended the Law Society's annual dinner. I couldn't have missed. Had I been asleep, I probably couldn't have missed um, what was said and what was said fairly loudly and clearly at that event. Now, I appreciate that the Minister for Justice is, is taking forward. And I. I, I support the Minister for Justice in terms of what he is, is attempting to do in terms of reducing a very, very, very sizeable legal aid bill in Northern Ireland. He has done, I think, work that is worth praising in terms of reducing the criminal legal aid bill, uh, and I think I, I, I would be wrong if I wasn't encouraging him to do likewise, given the significant pressures that we are under uh, in respect of resource expenditure. If he didn't do likewise then with, with civil um, legal aid as well. In terms of a role for uh, my department, there is no specified role for my department in working with the Minister's department to overcome those issues. But as this Minister, and indeed any Minister in this Executive will know, I have an open door in terms of wanting to work with departments. And I think if they have issues and they have pressures, notwithstanding the fact that the Minister's uh, budget is ring-fenced and he has significant budget flexibility within the allocations that he already has to deal with problems such as the one that the member announces. If there is issues that the member ha or the minister has or any minister has, early engagement with my department, I think, in the long term, is more beneficial than sitting and thinking that the problem will go away and won't materialise. Thank you. And I call Mr Alistair Ross. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I also thank the, the Minister for his statement this morning. In particular, I am drawn to the £3 million allocation um, for heritage-led development and the potential positive impact that could have for Carrick Fergus Castle. Can I ask him what schemes the, the Minister would envisage um, this money being used for, and whether the financial transactions capital funding um, that he referred to in answer to Mr Weir's question could be used for this type of development? Yeah, I, I I think that I have long believed, and in fact I mentioned it in my, my statement, that um, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency um, earlier in the year, I think maybe tail end of last year, produced a, a very valuable report which outlined its estimation that um, our built heritage, our historic environment was a, worth around £250 million a year to our economy, but significantly that it had greater potential beyond that quarter of a billion pounds that it did generate for our economy. It had the potential to increase that figure, but also to, Deputy Speaker, employ more people across Northern Ireland. Um, I'm, I'm, I, in, in bringing forward that motion back in, I think, January or February, I was kind of being mindful of the job that I was going to get sometime in the near future. I was worried that I might be writing something of a blank cheque in respect to this policy area, but I am glad that I am able to support it with £1.1 million in this monitoring round and £3 million in the 1415. Uh, capital exercise, and that will allow projects like, um, and I've had discussions with the Environment Minister in respect of this, and projects like Carrick Fergus Castle in the member's own constituency, which I think we would all agree um, is a fantastic place and fantastic facility, but it has potential to develop further. Um, and there are commercial opportunities within a lot of the visitor attractions that we have across Northern Ireland, which haven't been realised because that simply isn't what the Department of the Environment traditionally does. So to take up this point about financial transactions capital, I think there are other areas of our built heritage and our historic environment where partnering with organisations outside of the public sector, organisations, for example, like the National Trust, they have facilities which could be invested in to be developed, which have revenue-raising potential, which can then be used to pay back the loan element of financial transactions capital. This is an area that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in and quite excited about the potential in, and I hope the £4 million that has been allocated to the Department of the Environment uh, in these next two years will allow us to test out and to see just exactly what that potential is. And if it does work, then we can, of course, if money is available, invest more in the future. Thank you. And I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, thank you for your statement today. Um, the underfund in DSD budget is disturbing. Can you comment, Minister, for the House on how you perceive DSD management of the housing executive? Well, 
I, I think that if the, if the DSD minister was here, he'd be fairly clear about what he thinks has been historically, anyway, the management of housing executive resources. And whilst, yes, there is a reduced requirement uh, in the October monitoring round of some £23 million pounds for DSD, it is disappointing that, that what that was initially targeted for, which was repairs, maintenance of existing housing executive stock, isn't able to go forward, because the result of that means that there are people who need those repairs, who need that maintenance of their property, who aren't simply going to get that. Now, on the, on the positive side, in terms of the good, sensible management of public funds, we are able then, because that has been released, rather than just simply sitting in the budget and maybe not coming back to this until January when it might be difficult to spend it, we can sensibly then redistribute that, uh, primarily in this case to roads maintenance, um, which, creates, which will sustain and create other jobs within the construction sector, albeit not doing what was originally uh, done. Look, I, I, I would share the members' disappointment. I would share the disappointment of the people who may have thought that they were getting work done. Um, but in terms of the management of funds, I would far rather that the Minister for Social Development was saying to me that he wasn't happy with the contracts, that he wasn't happy with the way um, the specification in particular of certain aspects of those contracts were, and released the money so that I could spend it and allocate it to others to spend, um, rather than it wasted and, and, and being spent on over-specified contracts that we would all then come back in a number of years and say, why did you spend so much more on that when you could have spent significantly less? And I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and could I uh, thank the Minister for his uh, good news uh, statement this morning. Could I ask the Minister, um, if you could inform the House, why we haven't had more successful United Community bids? I thank the member for, for his question, not least because it allows me to um, preempt and probably clear up any confusion that there might be about the spending of this money. Um, the member will be aware that back in June, the, the Prime Minister and the First and Deputy First Minister agreed what has been referred to as the Economic Pact, which included, included a provision to allow us to extend uh, our RRI borrowing facility, um, which is, stands at £200 million a year, up to uh, 50 million, by an additional £50 million this year and next year. Uh, and that was specifically tailored for sort of shared future education and housing projects. Um, we are, as a department, not in any way sitting as the arbiter, Deputy Speaker, of those funds, we simply receive the bids that come in from departments and they have to then go to Treasury for their assessment and it is Treasury who make the ultimate decision as to whether they will qualify for the borrowing or they don't qualify for the borrowing. So it isn't a matter of um, DFP sitting and saying that bid's not good enough, that bid's not good enough, that bid's not good enough. Quite the opposite. We are encouraging departments to come forward with more bids. We think there is potential for more bids that will be successful with Treasury. But the ultimate arbiter on whether it goes ahead or doesn't go ahead isn't the Department of Finance and Personnel. It's Her Majesty's Treasury. Thank you. And I call Mr Alec Atwood. Thank you. Could I welcome the announcement in respect of the uh, Royal site? Uh, no money this uh, quarter for decaying dereliction funding. Can you confirm whether that oversight will be rectified come January uh, uh, funding? Could you confirm uh, further that when it comes to heritage-led development scheme, if the funding that you have allocated proves, to, proves your point that there is heritage-led development in Northern Ireland, could you indicate whether it is your view that should become part of mainstream funding on a rolling basin, basis uh, beyond your tenure? And could you confirm if the reduced uh, requirement of the housing executive includes reduced requirement for new built social housing funding? And if so, does that give rise to concern in your mind? Um, I think the, uh, the member may have left ministerial office, but he hasn't uh, lost his touch in respect of stretching the tolerance of the chair. Um, as a member will, will know, and he will know from having administered a departmental budget, there is only so much money to go around. And it is always a balance in these occasions of monitoring rounds between the bids that come in. Many of the bids that haven't been met are, are good bids. It doesn't mean that they are bad bids. Some of them are, are, are um, bids that have uh, new bids which have potential or bids for existing uh, or previous schemes which have been shown to work. Um, the issue of um, dereliction funding is something that I am supportive in principle of. I haven't been able to allocate additional money to it in this monitoring round, but it is not something as a policy that is completely finished as far as I am concerned. It obviously will require his colleague, the Minister of the Environment, to continue to come forward with bids for that. And if it can be met in the grand scheme of things, it would be something that we're not adverse uh, to meeting. 
Um, we've got to be very mindful, as, uh, as I said previously, about in allocating money at this stage in the financial year about issues like overcommitment. And I do appreciate that something like a dereliction fund is, has the potential to get money spent very, very quickly. So January has a better potential, perhaps, than uh, October does. But I say that without making any commitment to doing that. Uh, Herdy's laid development, as, a, as a, the member will know, he and I had a, a useful exchange both in the House and outside of this House on this issue in the past. It is something that is an answer to uh, Mr Ross previously, and I am personally committed to. I think it has huge potential. I think we have some underappreciated, undervalued uh, and underused uh, historical buildings right across Northern Ireland. I hope that this money can start to uh, develop the potential that I believe that, that sector undoubtedly has. Uh, in terms of mainstreaming that budget, that is a matter um, as much for the Minister of the Environment and coming forward with bids to mainstream it for the years beyond 14-15 in the 15-16 uh, budget process that we are about to start, and then obviously beyond that for, for future years. It is something that I think does have potential, and it is something that I am very glad to be able to announce funding for today. And, and I hope that it is successful, and if it is successful, whether it be through conventional capital or financial transactions capital, as I outlined to Mr Ross, I think there is huge potential for it. Thank you. And I call Mr Roy Bates. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I too would wel welcome the announcement of a, a new build of a, ch a children's hospital for Northern Ireland. But under the health heading for uh, addressing serious risk programme, only 5 million of 15 million has been allocated. And again, under the Transforming Your Care key enabling projects, only 7.3 million of 26.5 million has been allocated. So could the Minister uh, advise? why he decided to significantly underfund, particularly the, the TYC transformation programme, when the department indicates that a failure to uh, uh, fund them would impact on future savings and even the delivery of a ch change in expenditure uh, patterns away from our hospitalised care and risk waiting times at our NE units and our hospitals. Well, look, I, have to say, I have to say to the member, if, if he goes, he has, he has picked out um, a couple of it. I, I had uh, Five hundred million pounds worth of capital bids, Deputy Speaker, for fourteen fifteen. Five hundred million pounds worth of bids, including quite a lot of cheeky bids, I have to say, from some ministers who were were chancing their arm, including his, his colleague at the, the Department for Regional Development, who seemed to put every every single bid, every single bid. I, you know, remember, I was a bit of patience. Remember, was a bit of patience. Every single road project that he wanted to take forward, whether it was ready to move forward or not, came forward. So I had to contend with half, half a billion pounds worth of capital bids, Deputy Speaker, for what ultimately turned out to be 170 million pounds worth of capital expenditure at my disposal and executive's disposal. Now, as a consequence of that, as a member will know, you can't spend the 500 million if all you've got is 175, 177 million pounds. So you have to make choices, and that's what this place is all about. We have to make choices with the evidence that is before us, with the money that is before us. And if the member does, he is, he, is, he, is, he is having a go at an allocation to the Department of Health of £89.1 million. £89.1 million out of £177 million. That's a significant investment for the Health Department. It does allow significant aspects of the Minister's Transforming Your Care programme to be taken forward. Is it everything that he wants? No, it's not. But if you were to go around the executive table and ask, oh, well, the Minister, did they get everything they want? No, they didn't. Because that's the nature of the game that we have to play, Mr. Biggs. We have to make choices. We have to spend money where we think is best. And I think spending £89.1 million, including significant TYC bids, is a good expenditure of the money that we have, and particularly good for spending £15 million to start and to give the green light to a new regional children's hospital for the people of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mervyn Story, the chairperson of the Education Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And can I be associated with the words of congratulation in relation to the A26? It's not a case of the Minister winning the argument. It's a case of this Minister being responsible and Sorry. delivering for the, the benefit of the people in North Antrim. Also, the issue in relation to additional money for the DRD to move ahead with procurement for Rathlin Ferry and for bus procurement in regards to uh, the provision of public transport. As Chair of the Education Committee, can I ask the Minister, and first of all, thank him for the money in relation to Lisanelli and also the £2 million maintenance. However, can I ask the Minister to comment particularly on the continued use by the Minister for Education in regards to contingency fund? 
uh, despite the fact that uh, his own department, uh, in a letter to the committee just some uh, days ago, specifically well, said that uh, this was not a good financial management practice. Can I thank the member, Deputy Speaker, for his, um, his welcome of the statement. Or certainly, particular aspects of the statement with buses and ferries and roads. It is certainly a, a good day for North Antrim. Um, um, in, in respect of, of contingency funds, and I know we have corresponded as a department with the member, or rather with uh, him in his capacity as, as chair of the committee. Uh, as, a, as a rule, I am not a fan of contingency funds because departments, or indeed the centre, can set aside money in a contingency fund, and then if the rainy day never appears, then we have a mad headlong rush at the end of the year to spend that money on sensible, prudent projects. Uh, and what I find is that the later in the year you get, the less projects there are that can spend that sort of money. So, as a rule, contingency funds are not good practice. Um, but, uh, and, and the member will be where there are strict rules in terms of um, reallocation of money within budgets. Uh, all ministers have to, above the minimum threshold of a million pounds, declare. We can, the executive usually allows, and I think it's hard to think of a single example where it hasn't allowed for reallocation within departments not to happen. Um, but it is good, sensible management of the money. It has been allocated by the executive and by the assembly to be flagged up so that people can see where money has been moved to and where it's been moved from. Thank you. And Mr Jim Wells. Could I also welcome the announcement on the Children's Hospital. That's excellent news. Uh, and I hope someday you'll be able to stand up and announce the Balnehins bypass. Indeed, I think we could do a deal that we'll name it after him if he releases the funds for it. But he also has indicated in the uh, statement that £5 million has been allocated in the 14-15 budget for local road schemes. C could he maybe outline wh where those schemes are? Thank the member um, for, his, for his question. Um, with a deal like that, I'm almost tempted to reallocate the reallocations. Um, I have to say, no, no bid, no, just on the issue, Deputy Speaker, of the Ballinhinch Bypass, which is something that uh, starts in my constituency and ends in the member's constituency, is something that I'm very committed to. He brought in a German debate to this House on that issue whenever he was uh, a young whippersnapper in this House, and I did likewise a few years ago. Um, it's probably the only subject that has had been the subject of, of two adjournment debates in this House. It is something that anybody who has to travel that road, whether they're going to Newcastle in the Morns um, for uh, leisure and pleasure and enjoyment, or whether they're travelling simply home after work, is in much need of investment. But I have to say that no bid came forward as part of the 14-15 exercise from the Minister for Regional Development in respect of that project. Um, however, I am glad that we have been able to support many roads, including £5 million for um, what is detailed as local transport measures and uh, network improvements. Um, the, the Minister of Regional Development and I had a, a discussion before um, um, the executive meeting some weeks ago about some issues that were crystallising within his department. This issue came up and I, I pressed the Minister on, on what sorts of projects that would come forward. The only one that he did suggest that was coming forward is one which I'm sure the member will, will welcome as well, because again it will benefit his constituents in the South Down area, as well as constituents in Strangford constituency, is the A7 uh, St. Field Cross Gar project, which is the improvement to a small stretch of that road. And I look forward to the Minister for Regional Development bringing forward concrete plans in respect of that road in the near future. Thank you. And I call Mr Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his statement today to the House and as Chair of the DRD Committee welcome uh, the announcements in relation to uh, the major road schemes that he has announced. Uh, but can I ask the Minister why we are seeing uh, so many reduced requirements in relation to uh, major road schemes uh, uh, presently? The member um, for his, his question. Um, as I said in comments, um, Deputy Speaker, um, previously, I, I do have issues about how we take forward major capital projects, whether that be roads, and I think there are some very, very good examples where we haven't done well in respect of roads, but we haven't done well in some other areas of capital expenditure as well. And I think there, is, um, there are lessons to be learned from the way that other jurisdictions take forward major capital projects that I think we can transplant and adapt um, for the Northern Ireland context. Um, we are obviously well aware of the well publicised delays in the A5, which I have already mentioned, um, which have freed up a significant amount of money, which I am happily able to reallocate to some other uh, strategic road projects um, across Northern Ireland. Um, so I do not need to probably go much further on that. But as part of October monitoring, there were reduced requirements um, in relation to the A8 and the A2. 
Uh, the A8 reduced requirement, Deputy Speaker, is as a result of the cost and profile of spend on this project being reviewed. Um, when compared to the original profile, less was needed this year and more was needed next year. So we have managed to sort of balance that out then as part of uh, the announcements that I've made today. In respect of the A2, the, there was £11 million pounds of a reduced requirement in respect of it, and that, that's resulting from two factors. Um, £8 million pounds is, is a result of the cost of the scheme coming in lower than expected, so that's, that's good news. And uh, the second, the remaining £3 million pound was a result of the reallocation of EU funding um, to that scheme. So that has freed up money, which again goes back into the centre for, for reallocation. So whilst on the face of it, it probably looks bad, in terms of the, the, the significant number and volume in monetary terms of reduced requirements for roads. I think the member would agree, and I'm sure the House would agree, that those reasons mean that it's not as bad news as it maybe first appeared. Thank you. And I call Mr Tom Elliott. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. And again, like others, welcome uh, the allocation to the, the New Children's Hospital. Uh, there was a bid from uh, the Department of Justice uh, for the Northern Ireland Prison Exit Scheme of 17.6 million. I'm wondering uh, if the Minister has had any discussions with the Minister of Justice around uh, the impact that there will be on prison service reform in relation to not getting that bid, or, or was it uh, one of what the Minister would include as one of the cheeky bids? Um, there was. The Minister, I haven't had any discussions with the Minister uh, of Justice, although he and I are, I think, keen to have a discussion. We will arrange for that very soon because I am aware that whilst the Minister is, has a budget which is ring fenced and he has considerable f flexibility within his budget uh, to move money around to, to deal with pressures, um, I want to see him proactively manage that budget before we look at some of the bids that are there. But accepting that he is a man of his word and that there are pressures within his budget, I'm happy to have him, content to have a discussion with him about those pressures. And I will convey the message that I am conveying to you, which he is obviously hearing. I will do that in private uh, as well. In respect of the, the scheme that the member has talked about, I think it is a good scheme. I know the, um, the investigative of principles that are behind the scheme. It is a scheme that is so good that it has been backed before by the Department of Finance and Personnel in previous monitoring rounds. I think some £20 million pounds was given last year to the scheme, which allowed the Minister to um, take forward his plans in respect of um, early exit for some prison officers and then replenishing that with um, different staff, new staff. Um, it is not a bid that is um, a bad bid. It if it was a bad bid, it would, um, would not have been acknowledged with allocations in previous years. But I am pretty sure that the Minister of Justice will be back if not in this year, but in future years, looking for money for a scheme which is, of course, has at its core investigative safe principles. And I call Mr Paul Gervin, and we are into the last 10 minutes of question time, so I am going to do my best to get as many in as possible with the cooperation of members. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I uh, thank the Minister for his statement to the House? Uh, a very positive statement it is. Um, and it's just in relation to the DRD uh, allocation of £10 million pounds to the Belfast port to deal with shortfall and receipt. Uh, is this uh, any indication that the executive have given up on pursuing some value from the port? Thank the member, Deputy Speaker, for, for his question. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question because it, it obviously does stand out within uh, the tables as being something that, that has had to be allocated. Uh, in this year, which obviously we had intended wouldn't have been the case at the start of this budget period. Um, the, this is, I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to release value from um, the Harbour Commission. Um, I, I think that, um, in principle, it is a publicly owned asset. It is um, developing uh, land as well. I mean, it makes a valuable contribution, I have to say, to not just the Belfast economy, but the whole of Northern Ireland's economy. And I very much welcome some of the projects it's bringing forward in terms of um, a terminal for cruise ships coming into Belfast and also the, the City of Keys development, which will uh, release uh, more commercial office uh, property for the foreign direct investment that we are trying to attract into Northern Ireland uh, as a result of the Lexington Investment Conference and other work that, that, that Arnie Foster is doing. Um, so it does make a good, good work, but it is it has a significant amount of money within its reserves. It has the potential to release value back to our government so we can spend that money on other capital projects that are equally of benefit to the Northern Ireland economy. This is an issue, Deputy Speaker, which has proven uh, complex in terms of the detail 
the Minister for Reasonable Development would be in a better place to answer than I would, but it is, it is fraught with legal and other difficulties in terms of taking it forward. The fact that we have allocated money this uh, monitoring round is simply to recognise that we won't be able to crystallise and uh, make that allocation happen this year um, from the Harbour Commission, but we are, have not give up, given up on getting that value, which we believe uh, we can get from the Harbour Commission. We haven't given up on that, and we will continue to pursue that. And it's an issue that's been taken forward by the Budget Review Group of the Executive. Thank you. And I call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also be associated with the welcome remarks with what I would call Phase 1 of the 26 uh, Minister? Um, can I ask the Minister um, to give the House an update on where we're at with welfare reform? As I see, some monies have been returned to Centre from DSD under that heading. Yeah, the, there, there is again. It's one of there is um, a noticeable line within the budget of reduced requirement or within the tables of reduced requirement from um, DSD for welfare reform. Um, in respect of that, that, that is um, resulting from the fact that because we have yet to legislate for welfare reform here in Northern Ireland, and are unable to take uh, welfare reform forward in Northern Ireland. Money that had previously been allocated to the Department for Social Development to do things like IT training to, to, to skill up staff so that they can implement the changes hasn't obviously been able to happen because the legislation hasn't been passed. It is an area I'm, I'm glad the member has raised it because it gives me an opportunity to once once again reiterate to the House the absolute critical importance there is of ensuring that this legislation is passed as quickly as possible. Uh, my predecessor received a letter in late June, early July from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury telling us that we were now uh, uh, costing Treasury five to six million pounds a month because we hadn't moved forward with some of the elements of welfare reform, and that that was going to grow to a position where by the end of this year we're going to cost 50 to 60 million, and that 50 to 60 million pound will, according to the letter from the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, be taken out of our budget um, from if we haven't legislated by January 2014. And the worrying thing is that that bill is likely to rise to 200 million pounds by 2017, 2018. And in the context of what I announced earlier about a switch from capital or from resource to capital and significant pressures on our resource budget moving forward into future years, £200 million taken out of our budget to pay for something because we haven't legislated for it is a price we cannot afford. We need to move forward on this, and I know that's something that the Minister for Social Development is unanimous with me on and is seeking approval to legislate in respect of welfare reform so that those very punitive penalties that I'm speaking about don't actually materialise and don't start to hit some of the very vulnerable people in Northern Ireland who some who oppose welfare reform think that they're helping. Thank you. And I call Mr Jim Allister. Um, I welcome the progress on the A26. But could I ask the Minister, in terms of the allocations both within the October monitoring and the 14-15 uh, capital budget, how does it just happen to be that the various Sinn Féin departments have been most successful in terms of the allocations on October monitoring, they have got 75 per cent of what they asked for in their capital bids. In terms of the 2014, they got, over, they got 60 per cent of what they asked for in their capital bids, in contrast to other departments. Is this part of the, the Minister's party mending fences with Sinn Féin, is, as we saw earlier a few days ago you, with the party's love-in with the GAA? Is this part of the same process of the Minister rolling over to Sinn Féin? Well, it, would be, it would be easy to have forgotten that at the very, 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 very beginning, for about one second, the Minister or the Member welcomed the allocation for the A26. But it is very, very clear then that for, for the member, you know, every silver lining has a cloud. Every silver lining has a cloud. There is always, always bad news. There is always bad news. This is a statement. This is a reallocation of over two hundred and fifty million pounds, which is going to projects in all departments right across the board, which will be of great benefit in terms of creating and sustaining jobs. It will improve our infrastructure so that we can have a competitive edge when we're competing with other economies. It will assist us 
in our recovery. It will create opportunities for people right across Northern Ireland, and it will protect some of the most vulnerable people in Northern Ireland. Projects like the A26, like the A31 Macrofelt Bypass, like £14 million for the DUP Health Minister's Department to provide elective care that is desperately needed by his constituents and by other people right across Northern Ireland. For a new regional children's hospital that goes to a DUP Health and Social Services Public Safety Minister, there are projects which are it's greatly assisting our recovery, creating jobs and protecting the vulnerable in Northern Ireland. In terms of where allocations go to, it isn't a matter of sitting down and carving up this is this, depart this, is this department's allocation or this is this department's allocation. There are some departments, as a member will know well, that spend more on capital than others. There are some of the bids that have come forward that are more critical in terms of their timeliness than others, and there are others. So, now, the, the, the member, look, if the member wants to, to, to take the money that we have and allocate it then on the basis of some sort of sectarian headcount, yes. that, kind of that kind of suits his approach, I have to say. That kind of suits his approach. But it doesn't suit my approach. I want to send money from this department when it's, when it's given up by others to where it is most needed. And if that's the A26 in his constituency, if that's the new regional children's hospital in West Belfast, then I will do that. Yeah. That concludes, that concludes questions on the statement.